This is the Go Maluku Podcast. I would like to start now by introducing uh, Ghazali, who is the Indigenous Coordinating Body member from the Pacific region, as well as the Executive Secretary. Ghazali, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Aminatu, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it's um, And welcome to the, from my, from my side as well, welcome to the second virtual dialogue on, um, yeah, the, um, in preparation for the enhanced participation process. Uh, so today I will um, uh, discuss the, the topic of the day, which is venues of participation. I hope you all can see the slides. Um, it's not a very uh, big slide, but it, the idea is to give you, uh, to bring you up to speed um, on the, the topic of the day, um, give you the necessary background information, and also pose some, uh, some, some questions that um, for you to consider when you, uh, when you think about the, uh, the venues of participation. Um, so let me go first, go to the briefly the background of, uh, um, of this entire, of this entire process. So um, let, let us recap a little bit. What is enhanced participation? Um, as far as we are participating in the United Nations right now, the only participation category category that exists for indigenous peoples to generally participate in UN meetings is that of the non-governmental organizations, um, which does not accurate, accurately reflect the status of indigenous governments, because uh, that is what this NS participation process is for. And the NS participation process is the development process for this new status, which will not be based on economic and social council accreditation requirements. And to allow um, uh, uh, indigenous people's governments and representative institutions to participate in UN meetings, such as the General Assembly, Human Rights Council, COP um, the, of the climate change, for example, and to distinguish them from the representatives of civil society institutions, national human rights institutions, and uh, non-government organizations or local communities. Obviously, why should people care? Uh, while the United Nations has made important advances in recognizing indigenous rights and self-determination, our participation in the international body is still limited. And um, to, to echo the words of um, Chief Oren Lyons of the Haudenosaunee, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu or you are serving the menu. So that is a, the, briefly the background of it. And uh, the, the beginning of the NAS participation process um, is, is it, it is important to, um, to go to the root of it. And um, if you, um, it is now obviously within the United Nations. However, it was actually born out of the ALTA meeting with a global preparatory meeting of indigenous peoples for the World Conference that was held in 2014. The ALTA meeting was held in 2013 and particularly theme to paragraph 10 of the ALTA outcome document said that pursuant to the universal application of the right of self-determination for all peoples, recommends the UN to recognize indigenous peoples and nations based on our original free existence, inherent sovereignty, and the right of self-determination in international law. And therefore we call for at a minimum permanent reserve status within the UN system, enabling our direct participation through our own governments and parliaments. And our own governments include inter alia, our traditional councils and our authorities. And this ALTA outcome document is, um, yeah, it has, has, has a large, it's a number of participants that participated in the ALTA meeting was over 500 indigenous people from all over the world. So it has a, a very high level of legitimacy um, from, the Indian, from the indigenous people's movement, as well as it has been annexed to the uh, World Conference outcome document and before it was annexed to the World Arms Outcome document, it um, it had it became a conference room paper um, at the United Nations. And now it's uh, you can see it's A-67-994 is the um, is the official UN designation for the Alta Outcome document. Um, so that 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 is the root of it. Now uh, the venues of participation. Why we are what are we working working towards is um, right now at the Human Rights Council. Um, 
the this uh, theme to paragraph 10 was primarily focused on the overarching the UN, particularly the General Assembly, because that is what you talk about when you when you when you refer to permanent observer status. Um, However, we are now at the, the, the venue or at the level of the Human Rights Council. And the Human Rights Council in its annual resolutions, it's, um, yeah, it, um, for the last couple of years, uh, it has been um, focusing on uh, NS participation as well. And uh, particularly um, the, uh, the resolution of last year Paragraph 15, it sorry, the year before that, sorry, requested the Office of High Commission to convene a four day expert workshop on the, to, uh, with the participation of states and of indigenous peoples from the seven indigenous social cultural regions, including by inviting the submission of written contributions on possible ways to enhance the participation of indigenous peoples in the work of the Human Rights Council, and to prepare a summary report on the discussion and the resulting recommendations and to submit it to the council prior to its 33rd session. Um, obviously, did this particular uh, uh, paragraph was included uh, before, um, uh, yeah, before the pandemic had had an impact on in the, on the United Nations. So um, this uh, we have been postponing it, and now it seems that or. Oh, it's not it seems, but is this expert workshop is going to be held um, in Geneva um, uh, from the uh, November twenty first until November twenty fourth. Um, which, like I said, uh, November twenty one until twenty four in Geneva, and the topic of discussion today is one of the four topics that will be discussed at the expert workshop. So venues of participation, um, modalities of participation, selection criteria, and selection mechanism is, um, is one of the, are the, the four topics. And these topics have not uh, been uh, made up like that, as in um, just as if um, by the flavor of the day, these topics actually derive from the NS participation process at the General Assembly. And we, um, uh, whilst the general, the general the NS participation process was um, carefully considered, and and so we believed from the coordinating body side that it was best to um, uh, yeah, draw inspiration and and use the same topics for the Human Rights Council process. So this this workshop uh, that we are going to participate in in November is organized by the Office of High Commissioner and the UN Voluntary Fund for Indigenous Peoples um, in conjunction with um, us, the Indigenous Coordinating Body, to ensure that uh, the participation of Indigenous Peoples is, um, is, is yeah, ensured and also um, to uh, ensure that, that the, the expertise from, uh, from the Indigenous representatives that have, have prior experience within the UWO conference process or at the General Assembly um, can, can participate either in person or through providing submissions. Um, so, uh, so this, the rhythm of the, the, the dialogues is, um, is as follows. So um, on the 14th, with the first virtual dialogue, which was uh, the introduction to DNS participation process, Today, we're going to talk about the venues of participation. The next dialogue will be on participation modalities. And the fourth and final dialogue will be on selection criteria and, and, and mechanism. And um, this is all at a very fast pace and a very, a, a very um, a strong, short rhythm. Uh, and it's all due because um, of two things. One, there's a submission deadline uh, for the um, uh, imposed by the Office of High Commissioner for Indigenous Peoples to uh, to provide their submission by October 31st, as well as that uh, the majority of Indigenous Peoples are going to participate in the in the, in the workshop or are interested in the workshop um, will probably also participate at uh, the the Climate Change Convention of Parties that will be held in Egypt. So we don't want that 
or this to intervene with that process as um, the workshop will be directly after the, the climate change COP um, in, in Geneva. So in terms of the key issues, yes, so just now I had to highlight the, the brief background and the key issues that will be this, that we'll, we'll need to consider. Um, some key issues that were expressed at the general assembly level and there was, uh, well, once there was the consultations held by the president of the general assembly um, and asking member states as well as indigenous peoples for their views on, on the, the four different topics a compilation of views of so the president of general assembly compiled all these uh, these views through um his advisors um and in, into a into a document and some key issues were expressed in relation to venues uh, of part uh, participation i will not name them all but these are just uh, some of them that you uh, so you have an idea of what was expressed uh for example the first one was while noting the status and territorial integrity of states as set out in the, uh, in the UN Charter, as well as in Article 46 of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, responses have in principle indicated the need for enhanced forms of participation for Indigenous peoples in United Nations bodies affecting them, although some responses have expressed concerns about moving in, into that, that direction. Another view was there was considerable, but not a uniform support expressed for a separate category for indigenous peoples in the United Nations, including in a general assembly, uh, as the current procedures and practices, such as those applicable to non-government organizations accredited to the Economic and Social Council, do not naturally or sufficiently accommodate the participation of indigenous peoples as indigenous peoples in United Nations bodies. Um, there also appeared to be a convergence of views amongst the states as well as indigenous peoples responding that the participation of indigenous peoples at the United Nations should not below before not, for, should not fall that below the the NGO accredited uh, organizations by oh, sorry NGO uh, organizations accredited by um, uh, ECOSOC and that it should not undermine existing unique uh, procedures permitting the participation of indigenous peoples in the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples and the permanent forum on indigenous issues. Um, because for, for indigenous peoples uh, are able to register as an IPO or indigenous peoples organizations um, when they participate or attend um, these, um, these two um, UN meetings. And also many mentioned the need for native people's guaranteed participation in all UN United Nations programs and funds and the specialized agencies, as well as in conferences of the parties to United Nations treaties. And advice received suggests that the General Assembly does not have the authority to require native people's participation in all activities or as entities associated with the United Nations. And that is also um, why um, uh, the, for the indigenous coordinating body is considering to um, not only to, to um, uh, pursue and as participation at the Human Rights Council, the General Assembly, um, but it's also looking at, for example, and as participation under the UNFCCC COP um, as this last um, uh, key issue suggests. So in terms of um, um, for, for this, for the, to make the best use of our time together, um, that we have at our disposal. There's some recommendations and guiding questions um, that you can consider. Obviously, these are not, they will not preempt or prejudge your views, but this is just to um, um, yeah, trigger your thoughts and have your, um, so that you can get your, um, uh, um, yeah, start articulating your ideas. Um, for example, indigenous peoples might wish to support a negotiation process on ends participation at the Human Rights Council that includes the Human Rights Council to include in September 2023, a resolution to start consultations on substantial matters regarding the enhanced participation. And then to, to also include inclusive and open informal consultation on the draft resolution with member states and indigenous peoples, whilst taking into account the views emerging from potentially regional meetings. 
so that a decision can be adopted by the Human Rights Council in September 2024. Because um, it is very important uh, what we have learned the, that the uh, expert workshop uh, will provide a summary report as well as recommendations in terms of the next steps for an expert participation process. So these are elements that you can consider um, to ensure that a robust negotiation process is, uh, is, will be undertaken and to prevent the NS participation process going from event to event to event, whilst not building momentum towards actually establishing this new status for indigenous peoples. And there's some guiding questions that indigenous people should consider to comment on and these are also questions that uh, the Office of High Commissioner asks uh, interested people, Indigenous peoples and member states and entities uh, to reflect on in their submissions. So first is how could the existing level of participation of Indigenous people's representatives at the Human Rights Council be enhanced in order to be effective and meaningful? Second, to which venues would a new separate category for participation of Indigenous peoples representative institutions in the Human Rights Council give access to? And third, which criteria should be considered when deciding which meetings of the Human Rights Council should include the participation of indigenous peoples, representatives and, and institutions? Um, so these are the guiding questions that you can also find on the website of the Office of High Commissioner um, regarding the, uh, the, um, the expert workshop as well. Merci. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ghazali. Um... My friends, I hope you enjoyed this. Please consider to subscribe, to comment, and to share this video on your socials.